yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. The Japanese hit us hard at Pearl Harbor. The sneak attack crippled our Pacific fleet and destroyed our ability to retaliate quickly. When the smoke cleared, we knew we were faced with a long island hopping war, a war in which bases were going to be as important as bullets. I'm Admiral Ben Morrell, Civil Engineer Corps, United States Navy, retired. And this gentleman is the world famous sculptor, Felix de Weldon, far from retired. Felix was a CB in World War II, one of 260,000 officers and men. I had the honor to be the organizer of this brand new branch of the Navy, the first King Bee. I want to tell you a story about men who, like Felix, work miracles with their hands. A story of men who build and fight. The story of the United States Navy Seabees. Before Pearl Harbor, we had some 70,000 civilian construction men working in the Pacific. But we were badly in need of skilled workers who could fight as well as build. On January 5, 1942, the Navy authorized me to form three naval construction battalions, each consisting of 1,100 men and 32 officers. The United States Navy Seabees were born. Those original bees were a marvel to behold. They were plumbers, carpenters, heavy equipment operators, engineers, even clerks and school teachers. Their average age was 33, and their average working experience was about 15 years. They looked a bit ragged, but what a job they did. As General MacArthur remarked to me, the only trouble with your CBs is that I don't have enough of them. In the early days of the war, the need for CBs was so urgent that we often had to send them overseas without a full complement of materials and equipment and without much military training. However, this never seemed to bother them. The CB knack for borrowing, bartering, midnight requisitions, and improvising quickly became legendary. The CBs were less than six months old when their first unit came under fire. In August 1942, only three weeks after the Marines hit the beach at Guadalcanal, CBs of the 6th Naval Construction Battalion came ashore. Their job was to convert a muddy landing strip at Henderson Field into an all-weather airfield capable of handling anything from fighters to B-17s. The job was tough. Henderson Field was under almost constant attack by Japanese artillery and aircraft. Men of the 6th CBs spent as much time repairing damage as they did building. Throughout the three-month battle for Guadalcanal, the CBs performed construction miracles. They expanded Henderson Field and they kept it open and operational. At one point, the CBs kept working even when Japanese troops came within 150 feet of the field. There were a lot of heroes in dungarees that day. One of the most unusual acts of individual CB heroism took place during the Treasury Islands campaign in 1943. 
In the invasion of Mono Island, first class petty officer Aurelio Tassoni came ashore on his bulldozer, only to find that a Japanese pillbox was holding up the advance. While a CB lieutenant provided covering fire with a carbine, Tassoni raised his bulldozer blade as a shield and advanced on the pillbox. At the last moment, he dropped the blade and buried the emplacement. Even while Tassoni was destroying the pillbox, other CBs were coming ashore on the magic box. This all-purpose piece of equipment was developed by my war plans officer, Captain John Laycock. It was a five by five by seven foot sealed steel box, which proved to be the most versatile tool the CBs had. It could be assembled in many arrangements for a wide variety of uses, such as bridges and dry docks. Strings of pontoons became barges or causeways. And if you hitched an outboard motor to them, you had a large or small ferry or a movable raft. There were unverified rumors that the CBs had even adapted them for the distillation of spirituous liquors. Although widely used in the Pacific, the magic box earned its outstanding reputation in Europe. In 1943, the Allies landed on Sicily. Shallow beaches prevented the LSTs and other large landing craft from getting close to the shore. So the CBs made causeways of the pontoons and used them to span the distance between the landing craft and the beach. In minutes, vehicles and equipment rolled ashore. At Normandy, Captain Laycock's pontoon proved useful in a different way. The planners of Operation Overlord faced a difficult problem. The slope of Omaha and Utah beaches was unusually flat, and just offshore lay the hazard of constantly shifting sandbars. The problem? How to keep the landing craft from being stranded. The solution? Have the CBs make motor-powered ferries of their pontoons. During the first days of the Normandy invasion, despite severe weather, mines, and German gunfire, the CBs shuttled their ferries between the beaches and the fleet. They landed thousands of trucks and tanks and tons of supplies. This CB supply line started our troops on the road to Berlin. At the same time, our forces were steadily advancing against the Japanese in the Pacific War. By the summer of 1944, we had reached the Marianas, less than 2,000 miles from Japan itself. On July 24th, the Marines swarmed ashore on Tinian. Even before the Marines secured the island, Seabees began work on their biggest single job in the war the construction of the world's largest air base, a base that would enable the big B-29s to carry the war to the Japanese homeland. Working in 10-hour shifts, the CBs built the base in record time. They built six runways of asphaltic concrete, each a mile and a half long and 500 feet wide. And they built 29 miles of connecting taxiways. By the time the job was done, the CBs had moved more than 11 million cubic yards of earth and coral. On August 6, 1945, the B-29, Enola Gay, took off from the base on Tinian. And two hours later, over Hiroshima, she inflicted a mortal wound on the enemy. the war over, the CBs came home. 
The original 3,000 had swelled to more than a quarter of a million. They had performed magnificently. In only three and a half years, their motto of can do had earned them an honored place in history. Now it was time to forge the swords into plowshares. The world was at peace. Unfortunately, this peace was short-lived. Only five years later, the North Koreans swept south across the 38th parallel, and Americans were again called to arms. On September 15, 1950, CBs of Amphibious Construction Battalion No. 1 brought the 1st Marine Division ashore at Incheon. With the advent of the Korean War, it became obvious that the Navy needed a broader base of operations in the Philippines. The CBs were tapped to do the job. Their project, a major air and sea facility at Kubi Point on Subic Bay. They began in 1951. Working as many as three shifts a day, six days a week, the CB spent five years carving jungle and mountains into a first-class modern base for the fleet. Huge trees, some as tall as 150 feet, had to be blasted out of the way. Swamps had to be filled and an entire native village relocated. When finished, QB Point became the major base for the carriers of the 7th Fleet, and to date, it stands as the CB's biggest single construction operation. While the CB's at QB Point sweated under the tropic sun, others in a different clime were hard put to keep warm. In 1947, CB's went south with the bird expedition to Antarctica. These snow bees built on the ice, built everything from roads to runways, powder rooms to hospitals. Their support was vital to America's Antarctica operations. Each year thereafter, the sea bees returned to the land of the South Pole, and each year their contribution has been more significant. <laughs> Atomic power came to Antarctica, courtesy of the Seabees. The nuclear reactor installed at McMurdo Station not only produces heat and electric power, but also manufactures fresh water by distilling seawater. During the post-Korean pre-Vietnam period, the need for a new kind of CB developed a people-to-people -people CB. Right now, back and forth. Take a nice and straight. Watch behind you. Behind, watch behind. Okay. It's a straight line now. Good. This new breed of bee serves as a member of a CB team. Thirteen dedicated men working in the underdeveloped parts of the world, helping people to help themselves. More than one month. The CB team concept was born in 1960 when an Atlantic CB detachment was sent on a mercy mission to Haiti. Lake Miraguan was flooding, and the southern tip of the island was in danger of being isolated. The detachment, working with the local people, established a lifeline by building a pontoon bridge, causeway, and access road. In January 1963, CB teams deployed to Thailand and South Vietnam. In Southeast Asia, these CB team members, or water beetles, as the Vietnamese call them, have been training and building for the future. CB teams are engaged mostly in civic action, but they also have provided some military support. Early in the Vietnam struggle, CB Team 1104 
was assigned to build a camp for the Army's special forces at Dong Zoi. They were attacked by a large force of Viet Cong. The CBs and Army troops fought valiantly, and the attack was repulsed. One of the team members, construction mechanic Marvin Shields, wiped out a VC machine gun nest, but died of wounds received in the action. He was awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor posthumously for his heroism. The CB battalions began their work in South Vietnam on May 7, 1965, when they came ashore with the Marines at Chu Lai. No sooner were they on the beach than they rolled up their sleeves and went to work. The first major project was the construction of a critically needed runway at Chulai. The CBs completed this 8,000 foot strip in a back breaking 23 days. The CB story in Vietnam has been one of magnificent achievement under the most adverse conditions. In South Vietnam, they literally had to create the soil on which to build. Despite the problems of terrain, weather, disease, and the Viet Cong, the CBs have built in Vietnam at the rate of approximately $8 million worth of construction per month. They carved a difficult road up Monkey Mountain and then shave 200 feet off the top for a missile site. They have built under fire, and they rebuilt what the enemy destroyed. One night in October 1965, a devastating VC mortar and gunfire attack all but destroyed a 400-bed hospital the CBs were building at Da Nang. Two CBs were killed in the attack. 93 others were wounded. But the men, including some of the wounded, were on the job the next day, and the hospital was finished ahead of schedule. To say that the CBs are distinguishing themselves in Vietnam would be a gross understatement. As General Green, Commandant of the Marine Corps, put it, without the CBs, we could not do it. Wherever the action is in Vietnam, you will find CBs, building instant airfields and ports, roads and bridges, and the facilities vital to modern, sophisticated warfare. CBs are building two ways in Vietnam, building to win the peace and building to hold it once it is won. When they leave Vietnam, they will leave behind not only sound construction, but construction skills. Most important of all, they will leave with the Vietnamese the spirit of accomplishment, the will to get the job done, no matter how tough it is. Well, that's it. A brief look at 25 years of history, a quarter century of achievement by the construction men of the United States Navy. The Building Fighting Seabees. 
However, this is not the end of the story, merely a prologue. There will undoubtedly be other Koreas and Haitis and Thailands and Vietnams. Of one fact you can be sure, when the toughest, meanest, most impossible construction jobs in the world come up, they'll send for the Seabees because they know the Seabees can do.